the model that we have for nonfiction books is basically claim a universal thesis. Say, this is something we haven't understood. This is a new lens on the world. I find those books not always that helpful. The things I find helpful are honest human stories of how we all wrestle with these deep metaphysical things woven with ideas. And so all I have really felt able to do is tell my story of feeling very existentially overwhelmed a lot of the time by our concept and what, where I went looking for steadiness of soul and where I found a sense of actually some agency and some relief in, in these very, very old spiritual pathways. I'm Brandon Vaidyanathan, and this is Beauty at Work, the podcast that seeks to expand our understanding of beauty, what it is, how it works, and why it matters for the work we do. This season of the podcast is sponsored by John Templeton Foundation and Templeton Religion Trust. It's become a cliche to say that we live in unprecedented times, but many of us are indeed struggling under the combined weight of several crises that leave us feeling anxious and fractured. What does it mean to pursue our longing for wholeness in these difficult times? And what role can religion play here, even for those of us who might not be religious? My guest today, Elizabeth Oldfield, tackles these questions in her new book. Elizabeth has spent her career trying to lever open space for deeper conversations about what it means to be a human being, where we can find wisdom, and how we can build a society where we hate each other a little less. She's worked at BBC Radio 4, led a Westminster think tank, and is now the host of The Sacred Podcast, speaking to guests like Nick Cave, Rabbi Sachs, Rain Wilson, Krista Tippett, and others about their deepest values. Hey, Elizabeth, thanks for joining us. Great to have you on the podcast. It's really nice to be here. I usually like to start by asking guests to share an experience of beauty that they had in their childhoods that remains with them until today. Is there a particular memory that the, the word beauty evokes for you from your childhood? Yeah, what a beautiful question. What came to mind was that I always used to dance on the beach. I did a lot of dance classes. Anyway, dancing was a big part of my childhood. But every time I went to the sea or the beach, the expanse of wet sand just in front of where the, the waves come in would draw me with this very intense um, sense of needing to move and needing to move in these kind of swooping and looping you know, non-choreographed, expressive dance moves kind of just on the edges of the sea. And it was it became a sort of joke in my family that we couldn't go anywhere near the seaside without me kicking off my shoes and needing to dance. And I don't know that before you asked me that question, I would have necessarily categorized that as beauty, but that is what mm. came back to me in response to your mm. question. What about it do you associate with beauty today? The embodiment, the sense of the awe-inspiring power of the sea, that the wildness of the natural world and where it comes crashing up against civilization. And then my, quite, and it's, it was from when I was quite young, sort of mm. very unforced childlike response to it yeah. was to want to be almost in sort of the kind of conversation that you're in when you're dancing. Yeah. It really strikes me that it's not just a participatory reception of beauty, but you're actively engaged in it, right? And so the, the, the response you have is almost a delight expressing itself in some kind of participation. Yeah. Yeah. Kind of responding to beauty with creativity, although that, you know, that's not how I would have analyzed it at the time. But what the, the delight wanting to spill over in some way. Yeah. Yeah. That's amazing. Great. Well, listen, I'm really delighted that you're able to join us. And um, I want to talk about this new book you've written, Fully Alive, which I highly recommend. I loved reading it a couple of times, actually. Really profound book. And I want to, you know, for the readers or, or, and listeners and, and viewers who are not familiar with your work, could you say a little bit about your your journey? I mean, you, you've, you've had a really interesting career. You worked for the BBC. You started a religion think tank. Say a little bit about your, your story and what led you to write this book. Mm. That's not an easy question. <laughs> uh, as someone who cares a lot about stories, uh, you could frame that in many ways. I think the thread of my life has, has been, ironically, an interest in stories, in the stories that shape us, in, and particularly in the kind of cultural narratives and the way they create imaginative space. They, cre they create the social imaginary, is what Charles Taylor says. 
um, you know, it starts off just like a nerdy bookish child who read a lot of novels, told a lot of stories, just a sort of instinctive interest in stories as many children have. And then through studying literature and history and then going to work at the BBC and the like, right in the heart of this like media story production machine, I've really seen how those cultural narratives of the air that we breathe and they make some things seem legitimate and some things seem illegitimate. They uh, kind of frame the goodies and baddies for us. They they encourage particular choices. They sort of reflect our mimetic desires back to us. And so that's the thread I've really been fully pulling on. I made radio and television programs, really trying to get to these deep questions. What is a human? What is a good life? How now shall we live? And that was the thread that I was pulling on through leading a think tank um, and now writing and speaking. But it's been a strange zigzagging career. And I think that's the thread that I've been following. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, it's, it's, and it comes through certainly in the, in the book as you, I mean, you talk about, yeah, the decisions you've made, you know, along the way, the interesting journey you've had from having profound religious and spiritual experiences to giving up on faith and returning to faith and then, and then living in now an intentional community that is a fairly countercultural, if not radical decision to make these days. And one that probably doesn't make a lot of sense to people, but I imagine would resonate with a lot of our yearnings in what you call turbulent times. Could you say a bit about the, uh, and we'll get back to talking about some of these threads, but, but could you say a bit about the turbulent times in the subtitle of the book? What are you trying to speak to in our contemporary culture and, and, and the situation we're in? Mm. It might be helpful to, for listeners that I'm realizing the more I talk about it, that that phrase intentional community is um not always understood. It's a bit jargony. Right. So uh, people yeah. can think of it as a micro monastery. We are two families mm -hmm. who've decided to move in together with shared rhythms and rituals and practices, driven partly by this sense of turbulent times and this, honestly, existential anxiety that I am having to grapple with. And I think many people are having to grapple with, particularly people in the rising generation who are inheriting a world with, which looks just deeply, deeply unstable. The combined unsettling of the climate crisis, right? This wicked existential threat that we have really struggled to reckon with in any serious way, with the kind of geopolitical trends, growing division, withdrawing trust, and accelerating advances in AI that raise all very deep questions about what a human is and how we live together and what kind of work we value, whether we value work. And that sense that certainly the cultural story I was raised with in the 1980s and 90s was was really that end of history cultural story, right? It was really, you know, we've come out of th the Trond look glorious of 30 years after the Second World War, and there was a little bump there with the Cold War, but we've sorted that out now that the <laughs> Berlin Wall has fallen. And generally in the West, we are in these sunlit uplands of uh, reason, democracy, prosperity, free trade has save the world. And I think I grew up expecting life and the world to go on largely as it always has. You know, I had a very safe middle class, middle of the road childhood. The idea that life is going to go on largely as it has done is not the story that is being told now, right? The sense that change is accelerating beyond our capacity to keep up with it. And we might actually have set fire to our only home is a significantly different story to wrestle with and reckon with and know how to live within. Yeah, you're reminding me of the German sociologist Hartmut Rosa, who, who talks about dynamic stabilization, it's a strange term, but he, he means that, I mean, we're in this context in which what is stable is the constant acceleration, right? Like you have to keep increasing profits year on year. They, they can't be stable. Yeah. And GDP has to keep growing. Everything has to keep growing. And that's the only thing that we can, we can see as a constant. Uh, you also draw on byung Chul Han in talking about this context in which everything that is solid melts into information. Mm -hmm. And there's an interesting tension that that he lays out between information and narrative, right? That that information doesn't give us meaning, information doesn't give us orientation. These are things that typically we've found in religion, uh, but there's there's so much baggage around religion, around God, around the concept of sin. When these are the things that people you know like to discard very quickly, and you're leaning into these concepts. Could you say a little bit about your choices to? To sort of, yeah, to rely on the very things that, that people have discarded about religion in order to address the, this turbulence, this, you know, this sort of uh, strange context we're living in. Mm, honestly, it still surprises me. I, I am not someone 
formed in tribes that would go looking to religion in general, Christianity in particular, right, as a source of wisdom. Maybe religion as long as it's, you know, air quotes, Eastern. Right. The sort of sense of my life going off script is very strong for me. You know, where I was raised, middle class, middle of the road, largely secular. Most of the people raised in the way that I was raised have no interest in religion and no faith. You know, they were went through university at the tail end of the secularization thesis, this idea that, you know, that we're right at the end of the long withdrawing war. You know, it is the tide of faith is, is so far off we can't even see it anymore. But this accident, or I don't know what you'd call it, <laughs> this fork in the road in my life of being taken to a, a Christian youth festival by a friend's youth group and having a very powerful ecstatic experience um, is the kind of uh, sociologically acceptable way of putting it, <laughs> um, uh -huh. has shaped everything else, you know, maybe is the inciting incident in my story. And this sense that there is something, there is something beyond us, there is something beyond what we can see, that there is more to this world than just increasing my status, comfort, convenience, like aspiring to what nice holidays and a fancy kitchen island and a nice job title, like <laughs> that there is more meaning to be had has really dogged me. And it's dogged me through attempting to be an atheist, having these major faith crises, deciding that only stupid people could possibly believe that, and then circling all the way back to finding it this surprising, humane, psychologically astute source of the wisdom that I think we might need right now. Yeah, yeah. You talk about, uh, you know, your book is laid out as, as a journey from a series of, of polarities uh, uh, organized along the seven deadly sins. Could you say a little bit more about the the idea of sin as the human propensity to f things up, and like why is the concept of sin perhaps useful to us today, especially people who are either tired of religion, who walked away from it, are done with it, or people who you know may not even be interested in it, or or people from other faith traditions, perhaps? Yeah. Are you saying that I'm allowed to swear this is the first American podcast where oh, they yeah. have not bleeped <laughs> we, out the word? We'll probably bleep it out. But <laughs> <laughs> yeah, <that's fine>. um, <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's an on. It was a big discussion with my American editors. The British edition has the full uh -huh. four letter word in its glory, and the American one does not. Um, right. Yes. Yeah, so, for the sake of your future editor, the um, the human propensity to f things up is from Francis Spufford, who is this amazing award winning literary novelist, and he really set me on this journey of wanting to reclaim this concept this, I think, kind of known and lived reality of human beings that we we mess stuff up, right? We break things. We can't call it the crooked timber of humanity. That's not what I'd inherited as the story about sin. I thought sin was of no use to us as a concept because it was either this hellfire and brimstone kosh to beat other people with, right? That it was about imposed guilt and shame and it was psychologically crippling, or it was this kind of silly, naughty, you know, calories and cream cakes and right. like the cool liberated Halloween costumes or, you know, whatever it was. But at heart, I think we all need to grapple with the sense that we might have these principles and these values and these aspirations about the kind of life we want to live and the kind of people that we want to be. And we largely fail to live up to them, right? It's really hard to be brave and honest and loyal and kind and selfless and to um, treat other people equally and to really love anyone other than ourselves at any depth. Maybe yeah. it's just me. I, I don't think it's just me, but I, I, maybe it's just me. Um, and so this, re this reality of my tendency to disconnect, which is another way I really think of sin, disconnection, mm -hmm. um, withdrawal from relationship with my own soul or my own deepest self, if you prefer that language, and what it really needs, which is usually not what it's craving in the, in the instant moment. <laughs> um, yeah disconnection from other people from deep relationships intimacy and trust and respect with other people and yes connection withdrawal from the relationship with love divine and the connection beyond us but what's been interesting about writing the book and speaking about it is i'm realizing that this concept of sin even for those who don't know what they think about the metaphysics explained as disconnection withdrawal and fracture makes all mm. kind of sense because i think we see it in all our lives yeah, yeah. I mean, so one one way to approach it, people might say, is our disconnection from ourselves, from nature, from others around us, is just a function of our social structures, right? Like we are living in late capitalism and late modernity, whatever you want to call it, and it's just a product of 
social structures. And, and if we recreate society in a different way, we don't have to deal with this problem, right? And I think some of the romantic era had this sort of idea that that our, you know, fundamental the state of nature is... Rousseauism, clean slate. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. What would you say to people who feel, look, the reason I can't connect is, is you know, nothing's wrong with me. It's this damn world. Mm. <laughs> it's the structures we're in. Too big a question for me to have a very tight, tight thesis on, but my intuitive response is, can't it be both? One of the things I do is I'm chair of an organization called Larger Us, and one of it's about the kind of way collective psychological forces are affecting the political world. And a phrase we use a lot is this, our states of mind create the state of the world, and the state of the world creates our states of mind. Amazing. And so I think if we see this deep tendency to disconnection in ourselves, we would expect to see it in the world. And if we mm. see it in the world, we would expect for it to be forming us, right? This cultural yeah. story is part of our formation, which is one of those old concepts from my religion that I have found to be remarkably helpful. It just means who we are becoming and the fact that we have some agency in that. But in the religious sense, who we are becoming is not, we just need to strip off all our bad programming and heal from all our trauma and make all the systems just. None of those things I think are bad, by the way. But the, it's not, we need to get back to this pure state of the tabula rasa, you know, humans are default good and it's the systems are bad. It's that we inherit a complicity and an entanglement with disconnection and fracture and sin. And we need to move forward and towards love and towards connection and towards healing and towards um, restoration and reconciliation. And that that helps me because it's not that I think I'm, you know, this terrible fallen. I'm not a Calvinist who's like total depravity. I know enough about myself to not think that deep down left on my own, I would naturally make good and loving choices. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, that's great. So I love the way you've organized the book then along the lines of that kind of development into into becoming, you know, a different kind of person and, and appreciate especially the vulnerability with which you've you've shared your own story and, and in your own struggles on all these fronts. So moving, you know, from polarization to peacemaking on on the sin of wrath and then moving from suffocation to gratitude and generosity when it comes to avarice from distraction to attention, uh, from status anxiety to belovedness, from numbing to ecstasy, from objectification to sexual humanism, from individual individualism to community. Um, would you say that these are universal longings? Like, is this what it means to flourish for all people? Like, like we have, we all want to have these inner movements in order to flourish, or is is this a particular conception that I? <laughs> I'm just not the temperament to claim anything as universal, to be honest, Brandon. <laughs> I'm just not sure that's knowable by the human mind. Right, um, right. We don't, insufficient data and always insufficient uh -huh. data. Um, uh -huh. I, and it's, but the book is a funny thing, right? It took a long time to get the courage to write it because it doesn't, the model that we have for nonfiction books is basically claim a universal thesis. Say, this is something we haven't understood. This is a new lens on the world. I find those books not always that helpful. The things I find helpful are honest human stories of how we all wrestle with these deep metaphysical things woven with ideas. And so all I have really felt able to do is tell my story of feeling very existentially overwhelmed a lot of the time by our concept and what, where I went looking for steadiness of soul and where I found a sense of actually some agency and some relief in, in these very, very old spiritual pathways. The reception from the book and the people that have read it, my guess is there's a lot that we share in yeah, these longings. Yeah. I, I think probably yeah. we are made for a relationship and deep connection with ourselves mm. and other people in the world. And yes, God is what I think mm. is probably mm. universal, but that's my theological anthropology speaking. I can't prove sure. it to you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm in the middle of, well, finished data collection for this project on spiritual yearning among uh, scientists. And we're, we're looking in particular at scientists who are not religious. And it is an interesting question that we're trying to get at is whether these longings for connection are universal or not. Because some people mm. who tell us, I don't even know what you mean by connection. I can't even imagine what that would mean. And, you know, so maybe some people are unmusical, as, you know, Max Weber would put it when it comes to religion or spirituality. Or it's, or it's just that uh, we don't have the right way to articulate an experience that that is happening. Yeah. So my, I would love you to go away and do this bit of work that I'm not qualified to do, which is that my current working hypothesis is it's about hemispheric formation. Hmm. I am very influenced by the work of Ian McGilchrist. And I think that 
when I'm talking about connection and relationship and interdependence, it's a very right hemispheric right. model yeah. of the world. Mm. And he would say that's the master, right? That, that, that's designed mm. to be the master. That hemispheric form of attention yeah. is designed to, and, and, and is able to give a more accurate picture of the world as it really is, right? This is key. We live in a world that is left, encourages left hemispheric forms of attention. And because of neuroplasticity, the, you know, the more you use one form of attention, the more that strengthens and you lose touch with the other one. And for people who say, I don't even know what you mean by this connection, I would love to find some way to test, has, have they had mainly left hemispheric forms of attention? Right, yeah. And is it actually they've lost, lost? Yeah, probably lost a connection with the mother tongue because of what they've been paying attention to rather than it's not inherent in all of us. But obviously that just, that is because I want to prove my thesis and I might be wrong. Yeah, yeah. No, I, I think there's there's something to, I know, I know, I know Ian McGilchrist's work is a bit debated as to whether those, those hemispheres actually map onto how the brain yeah. really works, but I think there's something to that. I mean, there's a, some literature on absorption that Tanya Lerman has talked about in, in her work. And, and it, it seems that some people are more naturally inclined to spiritual experiences, but others can learn it as she did. And so, so it may be, you know, this is a capacity that is underdeveloped. I think and that's where I'm landing on it. And it's why the God bit is at the end of the book, because yeah. I want it to be useful to people who don't know what they think. Like most of my friends are atheists. I have a soft spot for them. I think there's wisdom here, even if the God bit is really an open question for you, but that it is, if you want to believe and currently don't, which are, more and more people are admitting to me, that the practices and the postures and the rituals are forms of attention that might actually make it easier to believe. It's not that it doesn't matter if it's true or not. It's that something about the way of attention changes what we're able to believe or not, what we rule in or rule out. You're listening to Beauty at Work. This podcast is made possible through support from the John Templeton Foundation and Templeton Religion Trust. Say a little bit about some of those practices, because you talk a lot about practices in the book. And are there are there things you might recommend to people who are in that position of saying, gosh, I, you know, I'm I'm intrigued by these spiritual experiences that others are having. I've never had anything like it. I don't think I can get myself to believe there's anything more than that in molecules. What do I do? Honestly, my advice is so basic that people find it quite shocking. Go to church. And it <laughs> like the Christian bit is massively off putting for you. That's where that's where I'm coming from. That's my mother tongue. Yeah. Yeah. Go somewhere else, but go to a religious congregation and be there for a while. Like, I think the way we think about spirituality in the West at the moment is hyper individualized. Mm. And I, this is very, very, very unworked out. But the next thing I want to be working on is how central the collective is in religious traditions and therefore how collective collective formation is the thing that really changes us i think i think we, when we pay attention in the same way with other people it has massively more power than just like lighting a candle in our room like no, and i'm not dismissing any of this meditation is good sure. like those mystical forms of prayer all good i think if you, re if you really want to develop this capacity in yourself go be with other people that's what pascal said in pascal's wager which is not really about heaven or hell at all it's much more this very honest beautiful Oh, he's, I mean, I have this huge intellectual crush on Pascal. It is beautiful. He's having this argument with himself. This evidence points this way. This evidence points this way. What should I do? He's basically like, go to church, go be with people who believe because we know that beliefs are caught, not taught or everything we know about how we come to conclusions is in relationships, et cetera, et cetera. So basically don't try and do it on your own. Join something. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I was really struck by that part of your book. I wasn't aware of that aspect of Pascal's life, and you know, I think, as he put it, it was something like, "Go spend time with people who have solved the problems you're trying to solve." Or, yeah. you know, there's yeah, something yeah, yeah. about the modeling yourself after after those who have shown the path in some way, right? Yeah, yeah. Um, it's been and we we have them. this yeah. like, in, and it's and it's a legacy, a particular kind of Protestant evangelism. We have this kind of, I must, I can't show up in a religious congregation unless I believe these following things. But frankly, half of the people in that religious congregation won't believe all those things on any given day anyway. I don't, half, like not half the time, but some of the time. It is much more about where, what, what am I committing myself to pay attention to? Who do I want to be becoming? And where am I most likely to be becoming that person? On the days where I don't believe any of this, I still go to church because I think that is the path that's going to help me become the kind of person the world needs and the kind of person I want to grow up into. But there's this beautiful line. He says, okay, go to church you know, be with people who already believe this, but what are you afraid of? Mm. So it's, it's this dialogue between himself that in so doing, I will come to believe 
is basically, isn't that what you want? And there's this like, I don't want to be conned. What if, isn't that fake? Like, shouldn't I be able to get there on my own? And again, I think this understanding of what attention is like and how we actually change our mind, which is not usually working out a hypothesis in our head, but in relationship and in community and through the testimony of people that we trust really helps people just relax about all of that. Yeah, yeah. There's a lot in what you're saying here that I think uh, applies to one aspect of our current crisis, which is uh, polarization. And there's you know some interesting research by the Polarization Lab at Duke that you know has tried to expose people to different perspectives, and and it seems that they only get more entrenched in their beliefs if you know if they're exposed to other perspectives. I want to ask you a little bit about how we become peacemakers and uh, and you know how we move from just just hanging out with you know people like me to people who are not like me. Uh, and you, you say a lot about that in your chapter on wrath, but I want to first ask you for that the excellent story that you shared about getting onto the bus and being confronted by this lady while you're sitting with your child. Uh, could you share that story? Because I, I just found that incredibly striking and, and there's a lot that we could learn from over there. Yes. Yeah, I think <laughs> I'm, I'm understanding how much we all have this instinctive preference for people like ourselves. It's called homophily in the literature. I call it people like me syndrome but how much it's exacerbated and accelerated by fight or flight and by frankly being tired and grumpy and like having low, low resources. And so this was one day when I was, um, our, our kids were quite young and we didn't have a car and I was picking one of them up from nursery and one of them up from school. Maybe they were maybe even younger than that. And I got on a bus and it was empty and I sat one child on their own seat either side of me. Um, and a woman got on the bus and she was so rude. And she said, move your child. And I was like, this is all these free seats. And there's another free seat of them. She said, I want to sit there, move your child. And I was just like, wow. Okay. Dragged my very large toddler onto my lap and said, and this, I'm really embarrassed about this. I was so snarky. I was like, I am trying to teach my children good manners. You could have a, you could use a please or a thank you. And then she sat down and we sat there and I don't know if you've ever had this, but I was just so full of rage. Just like, how dare you? I wish I'd said no, you know, muttering to myself, basically. Um, and I could feel her tension, right? And her annoyance. And there was both of us in this like confined space, super stressed. And for whatever reason, I'd been reading about this parenting technique of do-overs and I knew we had a while to go on this bus. And I thought, I don't want to sit here feeling this disgusting rage and resentment. So I just said, should we start again? <laughs> my name's Elizabeth what's your name and it completely transformed the situation she mm. laughed it released so, like it's discharged some of the stress hormone I think is what it does it's unexpected and she told me her name and I said where do you live and we got chatting and she'd been to the hospital and she was in pain and her particular type of pain I have experienced so we had something in common right and then vulnerability gets in the mix and we had a really lovely 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 conversation and towards the end of the bus journey it, the bus had super filled up and i don't know if you have this but on london buses there's an area where you park your buggies strollers do you call them strollers yeah mm -hmm. and um someone had gone and there was always two strollers there someone else had gone and they were like shoving the stroller around and they're like who's this who's this and i i couldn't get out because i had a kid on my lap and everything was too crowded in and the woman next to me just was like would you give her a minute she's doing her best <laughs> it's amazing <laughs> So we left the bus having completely transformed it because of this very simple thing of just being willing to change the dynamic a little bit. Yeah, yeah. How do you? How have you seen that kind of transformation play out either in the, in the communities you're in or, or elsewhere in the world? Is, is how how can we actually in in these polarized times where we don't want to trust other people? We've got you know fixed opinions in the U.S. Now we have elections coming up pretty soon. I think this is intensifying. Is there any anything we could learn in that? you know, in terms of moving in that, in that direction. Yeah, lots. I mean, this is the podcast that I host trying to model this. And I think it is one of those strange things that's actually, it's a really simple thing in us and we can take very simple steps, but there is no scaffolding for it and there is no teaching around it. But I, I, I summarize the two things you need to know is homophily, which is people like me syndrome. Everyone prefers people who remind them of themselves. It's a constant across cultures and centuries. It doesn't make you a terrible person. You have to keep an eye on it and be deliberately spending time with people not like yourself and listening to people not like yourself and noticing in you the ridiculous preferences of people who like wear the same glasses as you or remind you of, you know, I saw someone with, a, with on the train the other day was using the same brand of pen that I really like and seek out. And my brain went, they seem like a good person. 
right? <laughs> it's ridiculous. It's ridiculous, but we all do it and we need to keep an eye on it. Mm-hmm. And the way that fight or flight increases our homophily, like accelerates our desire for people like ourselves. And so the way that we change that is we notice when we're triggered and we do this thing that Jesus talked about, which is turning the other cheek. And turning the other cheek is a really enigmatic phrase. If you're not someone that gets hit in the face, like it comes from if when you're, when someone strikes you in the face, turn the other cheek. It's really famous, but it's really hard to know how to apply if you're not regularly being struck in the face. And I came to understand it as a very deliberate, quite badass way that we can respond to any situation of threat, social discomfort, conflict. Because when someone attacks you, demeans you, disagrees with you, um, dismisses your identity or your tribe or your group or your political position, we get a flood of stress hormone triggered into fight or flight. I won't go into freeze and fawn. And the natural reaction is therefore to attack back or to withdraw into our tribes and our parallel communities. And what turning the other cheek means is keeping the conversation open, keeping the relationship open, keeping the connection open. And what that often cashes out into is rather than responding with anger, saying, asking a question, help me understand. I can Mm. hear you're angry or would you like to come for dinner? Which is where I usually land. Mm. That's great. I want to ask you a little bit about uh, the the move from greed to generosity and gratitude. And the you know, this again, I think is one aspect of our of our crisis we're in. And and going back to Hart Macrosa, I mean, he talks about this constant situation we're in of of wanting more and more things to be available to us and then accessible and, and attainable, right? So we're in this rat race because we we're constantly chasing after attaining those things that are increasingly becoming accessible to us in the in the world, right? And and there are many ways in which I think you're suggesting that religious communities and practices and traditions can help us put a stop to this constant chasing. Could you say a little bit about the practices and decisions you've made in order to to, to make this move from avarice to to gratitude and generosity? I mean, I feel like I'm a hypocrite in all these areas. This is the worst. (laughs) I feel like such a beginner. The way we've set up an economic story to be repeatedly accelerating our avarice means I think we're all formed into being hypocrites. And Oliver James, who is not religious at all, as far as I know, talks about this a lot in affluenza, that one of the key ways that this, he talks about affluenza as a virus, you know, this, this insatiable hunger for more and more and more, never being satisfied with enough, having no concept of enough, that um, forms of religious practice are one of the only known antidotes to affluenza. Because the claim, and it's a truth claim of my tradition, is not only that money won't make you happy, but that it is dangerous for your soul. Like it's Christianity in particular is like radically ambig- ambivalent about money and wealth in particular. Love of money is the root of all evil. You know, there's ways you can nuance these verses, but looked at as straightforwardly as you can, the accumulation of wealth is bad for us. And I still want to accumulate wealth, <laughs> but I at least am attempting to be formed by a story that is calling that into question. And reminding me what actually helps me flourish, which again, we know from the positive psychology literature, which basically agrees with religion, which is deep relationships, being in community, which again, collective religious practice helps you with sense of meaning and purpose in your life, a level of freedom and health, which actually randomly religious people do tend to be healthier. We're not quite sure what the mechanism is there. So yes, that kind of like what the way religion has some claims about what a good life is and what's important and it's not getting rich, and then continually reminds you of it and gives you rituals and practices and forms of attention to be acting as some kind of antidote to the economic story is where I think it's power lies in this area. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, no, it's, it's, it's really helpful for you to, um, you know, to talk about the I mean, the way in which, again, living in community with other people forces you to, you know, share details about your economic lives or, or even make decisions to tithe. And, and I, I think you had mentioned you would stop buying new clothing, for instance. And, and those are those are all very challenging practices for, I think, most of us to, to think about. But I, yeah, I do think it's, you know, something like that seems to be needed to put the brakes on the constant, you know, uh, hamster wheel we're on. Uh, I want to ask a little bit about pride and the movement to, you know, out of individualism. You quote Oliver Berkman, who says that freedom is to be found not in achieving greater sovereignty over your own schedule, but in allowing yourself to be constrained by the rhythms of community, participating in forms of social life where you don't get to decide exactly what you do or when you do it. 
Um, it sounds really paradoxical, right? How do you achieve freedom by submitting to constraint and uh, especially, you know, sub almost subjecting yourself to other people, right? And again, it seems in our individualistic times, this is uh, really an affront to many of us. But what has your experience been uh, of, of living in community and how you found freedom in this this experience? Yeah, it is, isn't it? It's one of the most entrenched lies that we tell about what a good life is, more autonomy. Another thing that Oliver Berkman says is that the way that cashes out in our society is the freedom to never see your friends, right? Mm. All that mm. autonomy leaves us immensely lonely. And if, as I believe, we are made for each other and we are made by each other, we are relational into our bones. And you can do that through your theolo Trinitarian theological anthropology, but you can also do it through sociology, you know, understanding of mirror neurons. There's like, there are many, many ways that we are coming to know that we are, that, that there is a myth of the individual. Yeah. <laughs> Brilliant. Just until we're more like those trees with all the roots connected under the surface. Right. Yeah. Um, so living in community has involved releasing some autonomy over my time. We have some really quite rigorous commitments to each other. You know, we get up and do morning prayer. We do Compline. Wednesday night is house night. Friday morning, we read the Bible together. Once a month, we have a house day that we spend together. Monday evenings, we host big open table dinners. Like I'd say a third of my time every week is spent with commitments to this very small community and what we want to do together, which restricts other bits of my life. But I have felt like I've grown up my soul more living in community for three years than the like previous 20 years. And it is one of those claims of religion that doesn't make much sense outside that imaginative world. But my experience is that in, in creating some covenant commitments to the things I want to be defining my life and the things I want to be being formed by, I feel more free. It's weird. Mm, yeah. Yeah. I think it's a challenge even for people in, in religious communities. I, one of the research projects we did, we found that people who are really active in their faith communities in the US anyway, rarely share their personal struggles and problems with others in their faith community. And so there's, there's, you know, maybe a desire to keep up appearances or uh, just no clear sort of practices, right? No, no sort of mechanisms by which one would do that, where we found some variation there, we, we found that it was the, the Catholic and Jewish communities that did the worst and the best were the, the, the African American Protestants who, Black Baptists in particular, who have practices of coming together and asking for prayer and, and, and receiving prayer, right? So you, you don't share problems as venting, but as an experience where someone loves you. Um, and I think we have a lot to learn about the kinds of practices, even in faith communities that are genuinely going to foster connection yeah. and vulnerability because because the church can be a really alienating experience for a lot of people yeah, yeah can i offer a hypothesis about that yeah, yeah. i think you should do some cross tabulation around economics mm, because mm, i write mm. about it in the avarice chapter i think that one of the things that disconnects us is the re the reason that money is warned against is for i'm sure reasons that i don't understand but i have come to believe that it's because it re it relationally distances us from each other mm -hmm. because we don't need each other and we are designed to meet each mm -hmm. other's needs and what kind of this stage of capitalism does is encourages us to be able to meet all of our own needs and find our own safety because other people are annoying frankly and it's difficult yeah. being vulnerable and asking for help and if as my understandings are correct the kind of black baptist populations in the us have historically been poorer then those, the context of interdependence that's economic may be as important as the practices and the postures and the theology for helping them actually show up and be and know themselves and see and be seen and love and be loved. Yeah, no, that's something for us to look into. Yeah. I'm oh, sorry, I'm just like giving you tasks to, in things I'm interested well, it's in. Great. No, it's very helpful. Yeah, no, this is, I mean, yeah, we have, you know, we're, we're trying to figure out, make sense of the mechanisms too, right? And and to understand, yeah, is it, you know, would we find differences in, in wealthier communities and maybe more more of a desire to keep people away? You know, certainly their, their um, houses are bigger and further distanced from each other so that it's yeah. self-communicates something. And that something. envy status thing, like yeah. we are formed yeah. by a story about not, not wanting or needing help. And I think that's yeah. sort of what sin is, really. Right. Yeah. Yeah. What have you learned? I mean, you have, you know, a lot of people in your community who, who come to your dinners are, are not people of faith. Are there ways in which people who are uh, believers and non-believers can learn from each other when it comes to this longing for wholeness, living a, a fully human life? Mm. Uh, I just think listening is the heart of everything good. And it's annoying because it sounds so boring and it's really not boring. <laughs> um, I believe that a good, honest question is a holy thing and that asking each other real questions and then really listening 
to what is beneath the surface of each other. I have almost no tolerance for small talk. It means I'm quite intense in person. I think I'm sometimes a bit too intense. But the the thing that happens at our dinners often is that we just get into actual heart to heart conversations about the things that mean the most to us. And then we listen to each other and no one's like, I am right and you are wrong and, you know, turn or burn. <laughs> it's much right. more, we are meaning seeking creatures with these longings and we don't always know what to do with them, but we're probably better working it out together than we are doing it mm. apart. Yeah. Yeah. You leave the God question towards the end of the book and you have God in square brackets throughout. Um, could you say a bit about that that choice and, and perhaps how do people who may have been hurt by religion or by a concept of God, what do you recommend for people who are in that position? Yeah. Oh, it's such a tender thing. Like I have much of that in my story <laughs> and uh, some days I'm like, how can there be any goodness in here given the absolute institutional carnage right and the repeated failure of christians in public and then christians like myself right um i put the god word in square brackets because it is the most semiotically dense three letters in the english language and i think assuming that everyone means the same thing by it is foolish and we're all dragging our associations into that gap and i'm really aware that for a lot of people I sort of want to have a duty of care to the reader. Like I remember what it was like when I was at least trying to be an atheist. I remember what it was like before I was a Christian. And you can set off an emotional firestorm. This question of, is there love? Is there a logic of love in the universe? Like, am I seen? Is there justice? It doesn't look like it a lot of the time, right? Mm. These are very tender, complex, intimate, private questions. And so I left it to last because I wanted to build up trust in the reader that I wasn't going to take those bruises or those risks glibly yeah and that we would treat it with care and with i hope appropriate humility of so much i don't claim to know any of it i think having been out of the church and then in it and then out of it and now like sort of slightly reluctantly and grumpily but properly in it again i always come back to to like to whom else shall we go i've sort of looked everywhere else for wisdom Mm. And this path seems to be the one most likely to make me feel fully alive and fully human, that there's treasure in the rubble and we can focus on that bit. Yeah, thank you. I realize you you have to run. Um, is is there any anything you'd like to add in terms of maybe maybe a question that you wish people would ask you about the book that uh that people don't haven't yet, or anything else you wanna leave us with? No. Um we don't have time for it, but it's hilarious to me that I've written a whole chapter on lust, which is very direct about the uh, Christian sexual ethic and very frank. And no one is brave enough to go there. Um, so I would say <laughs> if you are interested in sex, go read that bit. But, um, right. <laughs> uh, but otherwise, no, thank you for your beautiful and thoughtful questions. It's been really fun. Yeah, no, thank you. It's been a delight. And uh, where can we direct our uh, viewers and listeners to your work? So I have a Substack, more fully alive um, at Substack.com, the sacred podcast, or by the book. Perfect. And yeah, Elizabeth Oldfield, fully alive. I highly recommend it. Thank you so much for joining us again. It's been such a pleasure. Thank you so much for having me. All right, folks, that's a wrap for this episode. If you enjoyed the episode, please share it with someone who would find it of interest. Also, please subscribe and leave us a review if you haven't already. Thanks and see you next time.